This conference, this conference will now be recorded. Okay. Okay. Now I will unlock it. Ooh, lots of people popping up. Hello. Hello. Hi. All righty. I think Michelle's going around and muting everyone's mics individually just because it's a little bit easier, um, I guess, bandwidth-wise, too. Um, and we noticed, especially during remote teaching, that sometimes there's these unintentional noises you don't realize. Like, my AC always is a little bit too loud. <laughs> um, but I think we're just going to wait for a couple more people uh, to get in. So this is interesting. This is my first time using GoToMeeting, and I, I kind of like it. I, I like how I can see everyone in this little bubble. I can see Dr. Shook and her nice background. Let's see. Margot's here. Cheryl's here. All right. I think we have a pretty good group, so I think we'll just get started because um, we want to be mindful of everybody's time. Um, so welcome, welcome everyone to our virtual alumni event, Conceptual Work in Photography. I'm Michelle Pings Gaines from the Office of Alumni Relations and I'd like to take this time to thank everyone who made a gift to Manhattanville during the registration for today's event. Uh, your gift during these times is greatly, greatly appreciated by everyone at the college. Um, I have a few announcements before we begin. Everyone has been muted by the event organizers. Please be mindful if you've called in on the phone that we're unable to mute you and we will be able to hear everything the receiver picks up. So please mute your, your cell phone if that's the case. Um, if you have any trouble throughout the event or have questions that you want to ask but wait until the time to ask them, please use the chat function in the top right of your screen. There should be a little chat speech bubble there um, and you can just type in right there. Um, this event will be recorded and housed in the virtual event recordings library at alumni.mbill.edu. Um, and I think that's everything I have. So I'd like to introduce Professor and alum, alum Justin Capopo. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So uh, today I want to talk about an introduction to conceptual art and photography. Um, so I teach the photo classes here. I'll give a kind of little brief introduction of myself. Um, but I wanted to give you guys just a little bit of a kind of guide to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, just like when you're at a, a concert or a music event, you can kind of see, okay, what step are we on? It helps the process go. Um, so I'm going to give a brief introduction about myself, what I do here at the college. Um, we're going to answer what is photography, which is a very large, scary question. Um, how to determine what is art, which again is an ambiguous <laughs> Kind of subjective question. Um, and then we're going to look at some kind of artist case studies. Um, the idea for today is that we're going to kind of look on ways that you can expedite your growth in photography, right? Um, everyone has a camera in their pocket these days, um, and so we're kind of overwhelmed with images. I'm going to give some different strategies, um, both looking historically and just the things I use in the classroom to help you kind of elevate your work. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the Manhattanville Face Shield Project at the end. Um, some of you may heard about our 3D printed face shields, and I'm going to give a small little spiel at the end. Okay, so who am I? Uh, my name is Justin Capabo. I'm a Manhattanville alumni, graduated in 2010 uh, with a BFA in graphic design. Uh, I have an MFA in photography from Long Island University. Um, I just closed a show, a solo show at Soho Photo um, back in January, and I just did an artist residency in New Mexico, uh, which was a fantastic time. If you haven't been to New Mexico, um, it was just it's a beautiful place. Um, so I'm a New York-based artist. Um, I've had exhibits in Chelsea, Soho, London, and the greater Northeast. Uh, my commercial work's been seen in the New York Times, Symphony Space Theater, and other print media. Um, recently, I've been really into AI and automation. Um, I've been doing that a lot with my digital media students. 
and I've been kind of exploring how we can use AI to generate photographs and kind of take the power away from the photographer, which is the exact opposite of the presentation today. Today I'm going to try to give you guys and empower you um, to create work that means something to you. So one statement I hear a lot uh, when I talk about photography is that everyone has a camera in their pocket now, uh, so everyone is a photographer, which is true. Um, and I don't think this is a bad thing. I think when we're talking about the difference between photography and art, um, I think it becomes a little bit more clear why I think that's not a bad thing, right? So the camera is, is just the tool. Photography um, kind of started in the mid, uh, around 18, end of 1830s, and was definitely rooted in science, right? So I'm not an art historian, right? Professor Hannum could definitely um, talk about the intro to photo history. Um, but the idea is that it started as a science, right? And artists are always looking for new tools and new ways to express themselves. And that's where that kind of difference is, right? So here's an image of uh, Daguerre's street in Paris, right? Um, and talking again about how technology evolves as things um, move forward. Uh, this is one of the first photos of an actual human being captured on film. And the reason being is that exposure times are very, very long, right? Thinking about greater than 10 minutes. So anything that was in motion was not going to show. But at the bottom here, now I don't know if you can necessarily see my mouse, but there's a gentleman in the bottom left corner who's getting their shoe shine, right? And because he was standing still for so long, he appeared in the photograph, right? So again, I just really want to get you guys thinking about the difference between the kind of camera and photography and art, right? And how they kind of meld together. So an analogy I like to use is called the pencil analogy. Um, a pencil is a tool that we all use daily, right? We can draw with it. We can create, you know, prose and poetry. We can sign a check. We can do, write a letter to a friend, right? We can also create artwork with it, right? So the tool has multiple uses. The same kind of idea with the camera, right? So a camera can be used for commercial photographs. It could take a picture of a friend. We can take selfies with it, right? We can take a picture of a beautiful sunset. Or we can really make thoughtful artwork and express ourselves with the camera. So the camera is definitely, you know, a tool that we use, but I want to kind of separate those ideas for you. So the camera is a tool that can be used for a, multiple, a multitude of uses. We can think about commercial photography, right? So here's a picture of Bell Hadid on a you know commercial constructed background. All the lighting's pin perfect, right? And was definitely meant to sell something, right? We can use it to you know change people's views, right? We can do a kind of a photo documentary kind of idea, right? Or we could just take a picture of someone having a nice birthday cake. So photography can be used in a multitude of ways. Today. I really want to focus on how one can take the next step in their photographic journey and explore the world of art through the camera. So a lot of people come into my classroom, um, whether they're auditing the class and a lot of alumni come back and want to, you know, start anew, or whether they're just taking one of my photo classes in general and they're saying, you know, I love photography. I may have, you know, started in the film world. I may, you know, love taking photographs of my pets, of the environment around me but I really want to try to elevate my work. I want to do something that's going to be really personal to me. And one thing I always kind of start out my semesters with is the first maybe four weeks or so we talk about the technical, right? And the mastery of the tool, right? Just how I was talking about that pencil. You know, if you take a drawing class, you're going to be able to really learn different techniques or shading and being able to bring something to life. The same idea with the camera, right? The camera is a little bit more complex because there's so many kind of buttons and knobs and all these things. Um, but I kind of go over, okay, let's learn about the technique. And then I try to figure out something that's very personal to the student. So one instance, again, is pets, right? People love taking photographs of their pets. And if one of our assignments might be, you know, line, shape, and texture, they'll be like, oh, let me take a picture of my dog centered right in the middle. And, you know, this is my dog, right? And what I try to transition them into doing is saying, okay, well, let's think about, you know, what your dog is, who your, what your dog means to you, and what's their personality. Right. So rather than just taking that kind of document that that dog existed on May 10th at 4 p.m. in Port Chester. Right. What does it mean to be that dog at that time? So I'll have them write out, you know, personality traits, things that the dog's done. You know, what, what kind of behaviors do they have? 
And how can we represent that through photography, right? Maybe this dog is this really chaotic animal that's always running around the house like a little Yorkie or something, right? So maybe represent them as this kind of blur to the home, right? Do like a 10 minute exposure and have them just all blurred to the home, right? Or maybe it's this dog that just has this beautiful kind of silken, you know, fur and really just get in there and crop into that fur and try to find designs and patterns all about that dog, right? You make a series of five kind of abstract images. So what I want to do today is kind of show you guys some kind of photo historical and contemporary artists um, as case studies and then give you some strategies to help you kind of try to make that step. Now, I want to like, I want to, yeah, I would like to preface that I'm not the gatekeeper of artwork. Um, I promise that. Um, the beauty of art is that it's subjective, right? When I take students into Chelsea to see new work, you know, some students, you know, really have this guttural, just hateful response to it and say, oh my God, I don't feel like that's art. Um, some people are in love with it, right? Um, and that's the beauty of it. One thing I'm going to talk about a little bit later is once you put your art on the wall, no matter all the planning we're going to talk about today, it's up to the audience now, right? You could have had a really, really thoughtful demonstration of, you know, something that meant something to you and someone might not get it, right? Someone might take it in a completely different way. The same black square if someone's having a terrible day is going to look different to someone who, you know, works in the dark or something and has this different experience with darkness. So before we talk about the strategies to create art with the camera, we need to determine what constitutes art. So this debate has been going on for a long time in photography. Um, and often there's financial reasons that these debates come up, right? And nowadays, I think generally photography is, is much more accepted. Um, I rarely have a student who's, who's challenging whether photo can be an art form. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about some instances in the history of photography where those kind of challenges happened. So the first I want to talk about is Felix Nadar. So Felix Nadar was a Parisian photographer and one of the first kind of pioneers of studio photography. Um, he had been an illustrator and would kind of illustrate the who's who of Paris in the, you know, 1840s at that time. But he opened up a studio in 1851, a photo studio. And all the kind of celebrities and poets and actors at the time would come in and he would take their portraits, right? So one thing that had been, artists had been making a, a good living off of was miniature portraits, right? So if you were going into Paris and you wanted a small portrait of yourself painted, um, you were able to do that, right? It's a nice keepsake. That business slowly disintegrated, right? When you could just say, hey, instead of having to sit for a portrait for a longer time with my vacation, I can go off and get my photograph taken, right? And have that still to have that memento. Um, so that financial constraint really kind of pushed against the very kind of academy learned um, painters. I happen to have a little Felix Nadar CV card um, that I've gotten recently. Um, and I like to think back because he was a very, you know, I could talk about Nadar for hours, but I'll, I'll move on. Another time when there was this kind of, you know, idea of what, how does photography become an art form? What defines an art was during um, the F64 group that's first pictorialism. So a lot of you may have heard of pictorialism before, right? Alfred Stieglitz's work, and it was very East Coast, uh, you know, New York area movement. Um, and there was this feeling of atmosphere in the photos, and things felt very painterly, right? And the idea was that the straight photograph was a document that something existed, right? But to make something an art form, they needed to kind of transcend and create an atmosphere to it. On the West Coast, Ansel Adams, Steichen, and others in the F64 group thought, no, the, the, the camera itself can show us real life, right, in a way that a painting could not. And that should be an art form in itself. So the reason they're called the F64 group is that in photography, um, the way to kind of create what's in focus, right, um, is controlled through aperture, which is kind of the opening of the camera. And F64 is the highest one you can go, right? It means that every single thing's in focus. So if you look on the left at this Ansel Adams photograph, the foreground rocks are perfectly in focus, the midground is in focus, and that background that is half a mile away is also in focus, right? And it's very in stark contrast to the pictorialist image from Alfred Stieglitz on the right, right? Stieglitz's image seems very painterly, right? There is this kind of atmosphere, there's kind of almost a barrier to entry to the photograph. 
Well, the one on the left is much more inviting, right? You can see every crisp possible detail. So no matter, you know, how I think artists in general um, are going to push buttons and push the tools in different ways, but just wanted, before I start lecturing on, you know, what is this and strategies with that, I want you to know that, again, I'm not, you know, the gatekeeper of this. It's always going to be debate. And I, it's great that there's debate. I love nothing more than when we go to a, a gallery in Chelsea and a student dislikes a work for some reason. We can have a discussion and say, okay, well, what about it, you know, upset you? What about it makes you feel that this isn't valid, right? Um, perfect. So conceptual artwork, right, um, has many definitions. And there's different movements that have used the name too, right? So today I'm specifically really talking about how we can put, you know, a lot of planning and thought into our work with the photograph being the end production, right? So I want to distinguish this from the conceptual art movement, right? Um, so Richard Long, Marina Abramovic, um, he's the sole Lewitt um, quote. In conceptual art, the idea or concept is the most important aspect of the work, right? When an artist uses a conceptual form of art, it means that all of the planning and decisions are made beforehand, and the execution is a perfunctory affair. The idea becomes a machine that makes art, right? So the idea is that all of the planning, right, all of the, the, the rigid structure to create that art was the artwork itself. The photo is just to be able to document it for others to see, right? So there's a lot of artists that use photography in that manner. And I'm going to be talking about conceptual art. I'm not necessarily referring exactly to this movement, right? But for our art history buffs, I just wanted to kind of explain the place in there, right? So Richard Long's photograph, walking up and down, up and down. Um, until this kind of tr little trail was left from his walking and he was able to leave this permanent mark on nature. The photograph is a way for us to see that and say, okay, this occurred, right? This artistic gesture occurred. With Marina Abramovic, you may remember her, um, I believe it was at PS1, um, sitting across from, you know, strangers that would come and sit down and she would kind of stare blankly at you, right? She's a performance artist and her work has been used multiple times and especially at this retrospective show she had other performers performing her art right and there's kind of this guideline kind of like if you you know wrote a song and someone would be able to play it again right it's that writing process that concept is the thing that is the artwork right the end result is just for others to see so i'm going to talk about three artists today um and how they had concept into their work, right? And how there was pre-planning and how it wasn't necessarily a more kind of snapshot of that, right? So the first artist I want to talk about is Richard Avedon. So many of you may know Richard Avedon um, as a fashion photographer, right? Um, he's one of the more famous photos is a model with a, a long snake uh, around them. Uh, Marilyn Monroe photos, Andy Warhol photos. And he was very much known for his pure white background, right? Everything is just kind of less important than that subject matter. So in his, I believe, mid-60s, he had fallen ill and was in the hospital and decided he was going to go out west and document the American West. And remember that this isn't necessarily uh, a documentary photographer, right, who has rule sets saying, okay, I'm not going to adjust anything. I'm not going to accentuate different things. Richard Avedon was going to see, you know, no matter what he was trying to be objective, it was going to be his version of the American West, right? He was a wealthy photographer from New York, and he's going to see it a little bit differently. So the left photograph is of Billy Mudd. And um, Billy Mudd was hauling dynamite, was a, a man who had substance abuse problems, and um, eventually almost took his life, right? And he was at rock bottom. And when he saw himself printed six feet high in a museum, um, he was able to look himself directly in the eye, and it turned his life around, right? Um, the photo on the right, um, again, this, this woman, uh, this girl had all these freckles, right? And she has this kind of stone face on. And the idea that Richard Avedon always talks about is that no matter what you do and how you kind of prepare yourself for your studio session, the photographer has all the control, right? So they could take 40 photographs of me, right? I could be smiling in some, I could be just my happy self. And at one point, maybe I say a word or a vowel that makes it look like I'm frowning they could cut up every other photo and just keep that one, right? And that's now how I'm represented by them, right? As this kind of frown, frowning, scowling person. So photographers, you know, 
especially, you know, I have a lot of students come in and they want to do portraits and they want to have, you know, be like, oh, okay, I just want to make these beautiful portraits of people. And they forget that they have all this power, that they can really control the image, right? So two more images from Abaddon. On the left, he had, Abaddon had a dream about this man covered in bees, right? this almost Lazarus-like figure. And he put an ad out in the local newspaper, and a gentleman volunteered to have bees placed all over him, right? And he's sitting here. It, the, the gentleman said it sounded like a jet engine in his ear, um, and he's getting sting, stung all over, right? But again, there was four or five final images of this figure. And the one that he chose, right, was not the ones where it looked like he was kind of enduring the sting, right, but the one where it looked like he was in this kind of Buddhist state, right? He had removed himself completely and was just at peace with it, right? Uh, the one on the right, if you uh, know a lot about the monarchy and those kind of things, is the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Um, so I got the story correctly. Um, he was going to be next in line for the throne, but then left to marry an American woman and they were kind of in the papers kind of shunned and things. Um, so the idea is that you see this photograph and you say, okay, this is a portrait of two. They look rather distraught, um, but it's, it's a portrait on a white background, right? But when we think about the concept and the thought involved, right? Abaddon had done a lot of research. So he was in town, right? They were in Monaco, I believe. Um, and they had seen, you know, he followed them and watched them in casinos and they were just very kind of, you know, rude to the staff at the casino, and they just looked very miserable and just kind of not the people that they portrayed themselves as, right? So when they came into his studio, um, they got their kind of lady home journal, he always says his a photograph face on, and looked smiling and all, all ready to go and positive. And that's not who he had seen at all during his research, and not what he wanted to present, right? So he thought, okay, they loved their pug dogs, right? They had these, I think, three different pug dogs, that they adore, or the only things they really kind of cared about. And so he, Richard Avedon said, oh, you know, when I was walking up here, I'm sorry I was a little bit late, but I saw a pug dog walk across the street and it got hit by a car. And their faces immediately dropped, right? And he took that photo, and that's the one that he kept. So again, you know, I don't want you to think that adding a concept to your work or kind of this idea of pre-planning needs to be done on location, right? You can do it in the studio. And especially in these kind of more quarantine times, a lot of students are uh, this semester frustrated saying like, oh, I feel like I can't get out. I can't create work. And you'd be surprised the amazing work they created just constructing these scenes and sets in their homes. So the next photographer I want to talk about is Vic Nunes. Um, so Vic Nunes is a Brazilian American photographer um, who creates a lot of work using different, the best way, substances, I guess, chocolate syrup sometimes, sugar, garbage, all these different kind of things. And often has uh, has an activist uh, angle to it, right? So this work was uh, made in Brazil in these kind of large trash dumps. And so there's this group um, kind of community uh, of pickers who would go through and they would grab any recyclable material, right? And they were impoverished and they were trying to unionize. There was all these issues. And there was these, these really, really touching stories for each person. So what he did was he got a warehouse, right, rented a warehouse, and took portraits of it. And then what he did to give ownership of the works to them was he projected the portrait from the ceiling, right, like 100 feet wide, and had all these piles of the recyclable materials they worked with, and they had to put them into the tones, right? So they were able to kind of create their own portraits of themselves. And he went to London, auctioned them off, and gave them all the money. And if there's a, a movie called Wasteland, a documentary about the work, um, and just seeing them all being able to go see themselves in a museum, right, in Brazil, um, just all crying. It was a, it's a very emotional movie. And anytime I show my students, everyone's always in tears by the end. Um, but again, there's this idea where what, what is the artwork in this, right? What is the piece? Is it this large sculptural element that's made, this kind of um, almost two-dimensional sculpture that's 100 feet long? Or is it the photograph document, right? So there's lots of artists that you know, believe that line too, right? Are they photographers? Are they sculptors, right? Are they performance artists? What is the end result? Uh, Hendrik Kirsten uh, is an art rep artist represented by um, the Anziger Gallery and, and the Lower East Side. And he photographed images of his daughter growing up. And he loved kind of the Dutch master paintings. 
and he just tried to find household objects that he could kind of replicate this feel and paintings with, right? So again, really plain back, black background, but the thought in it and saying, having to pay, let me research and have enough information where I can kind of match that style with these kind of like a paper bag and a napkin. And there's this one image with just all these coffee filters all up on the hip um, that creates an interesting image. And so finally, David Leventhal, um, who just had a show in Washington, D.C., which I stumbled upon. My wife and I were in Washington, D.C. I love David Leventhal. And we're at the, uh, I think the National Gallery of Art, and we were walking around and, oh, David Leventhal, retrospective exhibition here. And I stayed for an hour, and we, we, I bought the, also a little postcard. Um, so David Leventhal, um, I believe, went to Yale's photo MFA. Um, and he had been playing around and creating with um, small figures, right? And so I believe for his thesis, it was a, uh, a war kind of documentary photo-esque play, but all with these little figures, right? And you can see on the images on the left that they're very, very green, right? The depth of field is very shallow. There's only a little bit of focus on one area here, um, a little bit of focus on the face, and it kind of brings you into that world, right? All within the frame of that image. In reality, it's just a kind of large little, maybe like three foot by four foot set that he's built he's playing around with, but he's able to kind of create these scenes. And funny enough, when the, the book was released, people thought at first, oh, is this some, you know, war photographer I hadn't heard of, and these are the images from the war? Um, it, was, it was a very convincing scene. The Barbie image on the middle um, may seem like, okay, it's an image of a Barbie. When you think about, you know, think of even the Abaddon photos, or just those kind of commercial photos from the 70s, this matches that aesthetic perfectly, right? This is really, again, shallow depth of field which means there's a very few things that are really sharp and in focus. And it has this beautiful lighting, the set, and he photographed it as if he was photographing a model in the studio, right? So you could photograph the doll in a way and say, okay, I, I created this little makeup on them and all these things, but taking the serious nature and saying, okay, I'm going to photograph this with the amount of planning and lighting as I would if this was a real model um, kind of elevates it. And same with the one on the right with this kind of cowboy figure, right? Again, really shallow depth of field. Everything's blurred in the background. A little bit of focus on the kind of handkerchief there. Um, and everything else is just kind of this beautiful blur. So I want to give you guys a couple different strategies to kind of bring your work to another level, right? And these strategies I often use with students in kind of mid-semester. And the idea is that you know, a lot of us have these things we love photographing. A lot of times uh, students will come in with photographs of flowers, right? And it will be really, really wide shot with the flower in the middle, right? And just kind of green bushes around. And I'll challenge them and say, okay, well, what, what about the flower attracted you? What, what, it, what was something that made you push that, that button, right? And they'll say, oh, I love the petals, or I love the, the little stem area, or the pollen around there. So what I'll encourage them to do is kind of crop in. Right? Try to discover something new in the photograph, right? We can all know, you know, a document of a flower, but what can you create from that image, right? And with modern-day digital cameras, you know, we used to always told to, uh, when I was going to Manhattanville, you know, don't crop an image of it, right? Because you're working with, like, 10 megapixel cameras. Nowadays, our cameras have 30, 40 megapixels, right? We can crop in and still blow up the image and not lose anything. So I encourage students to kind of go in and say, okay, well, let me create a series of work all from this one flower. How can I create five different images from this one flower and take away any reference points? And what I mean by reference points is something that says, okay, this is a flower, right? How can we just make it just this, like Leventhal, really blur everything and make it just about color and form? So the first strategy is photograph what you see and what interests you, right? This is something most people are doing anyway. Um, every week, kind of look at over all of your images and kind of cull down images to the strongest ones. So sometimes students come in, they'll have 400 images they shot that week, right? Even if you're using your iPhone, kind of just look through everything you photographed. And then just kind of take one pass. And if some image sparks out to you, save that one, right? And you may end up with 50 images. You may end up with 25 images. But the idea is you take those final images, and now when you shoot that next week, you keep those in mind, right? Try to see if there's any connections happening, things that are, uh, you know, um, somehow linked together. Every time you're pressing the shutter down, right, there is a reason for it. Something inside you said, I need to take this image, right? With film, it was a lot more precious because it was very costly every time you're pressing the, the, 
the button down. But even with digital, there's a reason you press that button, right? There's a reason you said, I want to capture this image that's happening right now. So next week, go out, and this is a very iterative process. So some people might go out three weeks and have this great series of work. Some people might go out for three years and keep refining and refining and refining, right? This, I think, is the kind of most basic and accessible one uh, strategy to do from home. Strategy two is set up a system of rules for your shoot, right? So an example might be every Saturday photograph only within a defined area, such as five city blocks or the main street of your town. Um, you'll be surprised at what you discover, right? I uh, grew up in Glen Cove, and I remember doing a little experiment with this, and I'd go every night for, you know, two months. Every Friday night, I'd walk around the downtown area. I lived there for 20-something years at that point, right? Um, and the things I would discover and find that I've always just walked over and passed by, right? And especially when you're going and saying, okay, well, I've noticed that inside the storefront there are these interesting images, so next week I'm just going to shoot within that. I shoot within that. And then you might say, okay, well, those images, the ones without the human figures attract me more. So the next week you're only shooting the ones without human figures, right? And it's a really good way to kind of narrow down your ideas. Example two is something like ride the E-train every Saturday from end to end at the same time, right? So some things you might appear or might notice riding the same train every Saturday um, is people coming on and off at the same time, right? Certain people going to work, right? If there's a couple that are always together, together every Saturday morning and now they're not, well, what happens? All these stories start to happen, right? And especially the trains go through different areas. So people come off and the kind of feel of the train changes at times, right? Um, there might be a ton of business people that just all of a sudden go away and everyone kind of just relaxes all of a sudden. There's all these different kind of things that you'll notice. Um, I had done it in Manhattanville, a sociology project where I kind of just rode on the train every Saturday and kept a little journal. Um, and that's just another way of just trying to think about a nice system of rules for yourself. So strategy three, Start with a problem and determine how the camera can be used to solve it. Um, so I want to talk about two artists that I know that think in that same headspace. Uh, one is Shirley Wegner, who um, used to teach at LIU. Um, and she, the reason I want to talk about her is that she had definitely, you know, used the camera as the end to the means, right? So the, she would create these large, elaborate scenes about the kind of Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And she was from Israel. So there'd be these large kind of dark scenes with these kind of like uh, plumes of smoke and all these things, these kind of room-like set, right? And then she would photograph it, but sometimes she wouldn't even be the one pressing the shutter, right? The photo was the afterthought, right? The, the, the piece was the concept and the, the thing that lived on, right? So there is this kind of idea of, you know, the photo being a tool for, you know, artists that use painting, artists that use, you know, they're still going to have to photograph their image, and they might end up saying, oh, this photo, I can do something different with my painting. Uh, an example in the opposite way is a friend of mine, Tyrone Copeland, um, went into this series where he would walk around New York City and take photographs of the sidewalk, right? And he would look down and see every little piece of gum on the ground. And he would kind of go and mark it in a little journal. He'd take the photograph and put in Adobe Illustrator little just data points saying, okay, this is where the gum was on this panel. And he would just every week just keep recording, recording, recording. And then he realized rather than having it end up as a photograph, he made a site-specific installation that took pieces of string and they connected all of the little dots around the room, right? So the dots were all on the walls of the gallery space and the string kind of connected them all. And you had to kind of interact and dodge them as if you were dodging the gum on the ground, right? So again, he used photography and you could say it was a photo project, but the end result wasn't photo. So it kind of works both ways. Right? When you're working in this kind of conceptual space, the medium is used as a medium. Right? It's, it's not a definition of it. So some work requires kind of prior knowledge of our history when we're talking about conceptual work, because it may be kind of riffing on something or being, you know, saying, well, I disagree with this, so I'm going to go the opposite way with it. Right? Think about Duchamp's you know, urinal, things like that that are, are playing on the kind of traditions of art. So it's the same idea if you watch a comedy satire, you're watching SNL or skit or something, and they're making fun of some movie or TV show that you haven't seen, you're not going to necessarily get the idea. Um, it's the same idea with art. So sometimes people 
turn off, like they'll go to a museum show and, or a gallery show and they say, like, I don't get these couple images, right? Maybe look into it. Maybe there was something that we needed to kind of spark to get you there. Um, so don't necessarily um, think, oh, all conceptual work I just don't like, right? Sometimes you have to kind of get the joke to be able to um, understand. So I wanted to, I could talk about something right now first. So one thing that's important too when we're talking about work that has a concept is the idea that once you put it on the wall, it's there, right? There's nothing uh, you can do anymore. You can put an artist statement on the wall, right, to help guide them. But no matter what your intent was, right, people are going to take it in different ways, right? So you could have a, you know, a uh, body of work showing, okay, I'm going to have this pro, um, I don't know, pro, let's say they're building a bridge from Long Island to Rye, and your work was about, you know, the ecological ramifications of that. Someone can go see that work and say, oh, well, they're definitely pro bridge. I'm so excited for it. Right? They're going to respond in a different way right? um, because everyone's going to bring their own ideas to the work. One example I like to talk about is, and to talk about how important an artist statement is and being really clear with your artist statement, is uh, I took students to a gallery maybe like three years ago and there was all these images of these kind of like Irish hills and cliffs, right? Maybe 12, 15 images. We're walking through and saying, oh, okay, that's interesting. These, these cliffs, they weren't necessarily, you know, these beautiful photos of them. Um, and we're walking out, and one of the students, Wen Kai Ji, said, hey, did you read the artist statement? I said, well, I don't an artist statement. So I walk over, and there was this artist statement that was kind of hidden in the path. And it turned out that each space was where um, the top locations for people that had committed suicide in Ireland, who had like, flung themselves in the cliff. So I said, oh, my gosh, i, I got to rewalk through the work again with this in my head. And the things you would notice, like little little gates that were blocking people from being able to jump and all these that kind of like the feeling, the atmosphere in the photo, talking about pictorialism, right? The atmosphere of this kind of foggy area completely changed the work, right? So when you're talking about conceptual work, it's really important to be able to kind of convey because um, sometimes the work might not, you know, hit you over the head with the idea, right? So using those artist statements and using uh, that information to kind of help guide the viewer and especially the placement of, of your, your area. So sometimes on the technical level, right, you can get radically better at photography with really simple kind of compositional tools, uh, such as rule of thirds and understanding general compositional elements. So I wanna add this just to help you guys, you know, if you're really figuring out composition, especially with iPhone photography, um, these are some pretty good tips to kind of help you. So rule of thirds is where you're basically imagining that there's a three by three grid over your photograph, right? And the idea is that most people, when they photograph something, they do it like on the top left, right? So this is this boat right here. They'll photograph the boat, and it's a great document that that boat existed, you know, on June 15th at 5 p.m., right? But it's not that interesting of an image. But what you see on the right photo, when you move it onto one of those lines of the grid, all of a sudden, it's a stronger image, right? Now it feels like the boat's moving. There's movement it's coming towards us, right? There's all this empty negative space on the bottom right, right? It kind of adds some emotion to it. So placing your figures on this imaginary grid, you can keep it in your head. A lot of phone apps and cameras will let you even put the little grid on there. You'll be surprised how that small, simple tool kind of radically uh, improve your work. So I added some of my work in case I was going uh, going a little too short, but I think I went just the right time. Um, so I want to transition a little bit into the Manhattanville Face Shield Project. Um, so the Manhattanville Face Shield Project started because uh, my mom's a nurse and she got, uh, her hospital transferred themselves into like a COVID only space. Um, so she was coming home every night, really distraught, and I, did, I felt really helpless. And often when I talk to my students about things they can do, especially with Manhattanville's kind of history of activism, I say, okay, well, write down a list of all your strengths and figure out how can those strengths, you know, help, right? What can you do with those strengths? Don't think high in the sky, the highest thing, see something on the news and say, oh, like, why am I not doing that? How, why am I not helping, right? And especially with COVID, there's a sense of guilt, right? When you're sitting inside and doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? And isolating, but feeling like, oh, I'm not being helpful. So the Manhattanville Face Shield Project started where it's basically saying, okay, well, one of my skills, um, 
is not only do I teach in the communications and media department, but I also manage the fab lab, which is our makerspace and the center design thinking. And so I have 3D modeling skills, laser cutting skills, this kind of manufacturing skill. So I went and did a lot of research. And if you don't know about the 3D printing community, it's a very, you know, uh, generous community. It's not about, you know, this is my idea, now it's copyrighted. It's let's iterate on each other's ideas, right? I might find a solution to something and people will go, okay, let me, you know, I think I could tweak this and make it a little better. Um, so everyone was kind of universally trying to figure out the best design for a face shield that could work in different PPE. Um, so I went through a lot of different iterations. I tried a lot of N95 masks. Um, the masks ended up working, but they took about 22 hours to print, so it wasn't necessarily the most effective. And we settled on a face shield because it became made pretty quick, and um, we can use a lot of household objects to help, right? So I used a design um, by Eric Cederberg in Sweden, and I printed out a lot of prototypes, kind of tried getting it the best I could, and we started pumping them out, right? And so first I started sending them just to local doctor's offices and things like that, um, but I wanted to try to get more into the hospital system. Um, so luckily I paired up with a professor of psychology at Columbia Medical Center, and he was able to help kind of be the logistical arm, right, and spread them everywhere around. <laughs> Um, so at first, oh, I'm trying to switch slides. Okay, so that's me. My wife took this picture of me at our old apartment. Luckily now I live on campus in faculty housing and it's very convenient to commute. Um, but at this time I was still on Long Island. Um, but you can see the face shield looks very rudimentary, but all the feedback I've gotten from the hospitals is that it works perfectly fine for them. Um, and especially from doctor's offices where they're saying that they were getting quoted $15 each and I could give them a stack of 20 for free, uh, they're very, very happy. And they're very easy to ship. So you can kind of see that they snap together. So again, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but on the shield, the gray one that I'm holding here, there's those little notches. And basically all I did, I tried a lot of different plastic fittings for it. Um, and it, these acetate shields that you put like a little folder cover at Staples, on the little, um, little Discord chat from all the different 3D printers, we said, oh wow, this works perfect. So I went to Staples, bought all the ones they had. Uh, and then it was, it was a little bit of a trek going to different Staples trying to find them. Um, but they worked out perfectly, right? And so I would just drill gun holes into each little thing and place them together. So eventually, here I'll play the little video so people can understand how it works. So a 3D printer is an additive process. Um, so we have subtractive processes like laser cutters where you're cutting something away. But this kind of builds up, right? So I, we make the designs in um, software, and we print them out, and it'll slowly build up, kind of like those puzzles. I don't know if you remember those 3D puzzles where you kind of stack each one and make a sculptural form. This will kind of go around in circles, and each shield takes about an hour and a half. Um, so eventually, we didn't come back from spring break, right? Uh, we were, the campus went remote. Um, so I brought them to my apartment, um, which was working temporarily, um, but the noise maybe upset my neighbors a little bit. They do make a lot of, they make a lot of computer sci-fi noises that I don't think are necessary. I think they do it just to make it seem like it's doing more than it can. I think MakerBot just likes the sci-fi noises. Um, but luckily, uh, my father also, you know, his wife was going to work every day and wanted to help out too. Um, so he was able to house them in his apartment and I would go every morning and help set them up and he'd run them all day. Um, and then I would meet Jay and send them and package them into different areas. Um, so we ended up printing, I think we're at like 375 now. Um, and we're still printing. We're not printing as heavily now because the demand's kind of fallen a little bit. The supply chains have, have gotten better. Um, but it's one of those things just design thinking where having this, this space, right, and being able to just instantly say, okay, let's do it, right? And I was really thankful for the school, um, you know, supporting, not only just supporting me and helping me get funding for it, but also allowing me to have kind of the control over making sure it's not just our major hospital vendors, right? Um, so I didn't want all of this, the, the small little personal things where someone worked at the Costco, you know, support desk or someone worked at Target or someone worked in a dentist's office and they needed face shields and they had no other means of getting it. Um, so we had a good kind of compromise where I went and gave them all to the hospitals, but also was able to still do those individual ones as well. Um, so it's been a really uh, enriching kind of time um, this is from a past alumni event. 
And eventually, <laughs> it made it to News 12 and the Today Show and all these things. And all of a sudden, I got a gazillion emails a day. And it was a little overwhelming. So if you know the associate provost, uh, Dr. Car Allison Carson, um, she took up that logistical end and made a whole new email and handled all that. Um, so once it spread, it was really helpful. People started reaching out. We got a lot of great donations. Uh, if anyone's interested in donating to the Face Show Project or anything like that that's on the Manhattan Bill website, obviously donate to the Alumni Fund first, um, since this is an alumni lecture. Um, but you know, we were able to get even more 3D printers and really start printing at a higher speed. Um, so perfect. So that's it for me. I think we can definitely do a question time. Uh, Michelle, I don't know if anything's in the chat or if anyone has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat. Michelle can read it out or I don't know how Michelle wants to do it. Yeah, it doesn't look like there's any questions in the chat, but if anybody has a question, um, I suppose you can unmute yourself or we can put it in the chat that you have a question. You can unmute yourself in order. I really know how. Are we unleashing the floodgates here? Or do, are we <laughs> quiet? Well, one thing I noticed with the uh, the microphones is sometimes when everyone turns them on, it becomes just a chaotic thing. But yeah, feel free. Right, right, right. So does anybody have any questions for Justin? Nothing? Either a good sign or a bad sign. So let's say, <laughs> oh, something popped up. Oh, okay, so um, oh sure. Someone asked to Absolutely. go back to your photos and talk about them. Yeah, two two people said that, so that's great. Let's do that. Absolutely. So let me go. I'll start with this series, which was my more recent series. Um, so I had a minor stroke about three years ago, um, and got diagnosed with this type of autonomic dysfunction. Um, that kind of changed my whole life in a way. Um, so I thought I was never going to be able to photograph again. I had just um, started, you know. Um, uh, transitioning into a more full-time position here and it was it was a scary time um, but what I did was I started saying okay well how can I still photograph myself um, so I set up a background and started trying to really document that time in my life um, here I look moderately confused and I can promise you I was completely confused <laughs> um, so one of the, the symptoms of dysautonomia is that there's this kind of brain fog that happens um, my body stops regulating blood pressure and heart rate and all these things. So blood doesn't really make it to my brain sometimes. Um, before every class, like the first class, uh, even to this semester, I always say, you know, hey, sometimes I might stay sat into blindness for 10 minutes. Just, you know, keep working. I'll, I'll come back from it. <laughs> um, so this work is really me kind of trying to show um, that area here. So this is when my face was still kind of slanted. So on the right side, you can see I had this kind of this slant. It's better now. It's, uh, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong on that side. Um, I know you can see the camera in my eyes. I give myself um, a pass on that one just because I was really sick. That was my logic. Uh, usually I'd be like, oh, Justin, you can see the camera on your uh, pupils. And I could have blacked it out, but I thought it was important to show that this was very, like, you know, uh, kind of do-it-yourself kind of feel to it. Um, here's me with one of the, the doohickeys I had to wear. Um, it was a a litany of tests to get to understand what was wrong with me. So there was um, spinal taps and all these kind of things, these catheters and these tests on the brain. Um, but now I'm doing great. So I just have to I take eight pills a day and I wear my compression stockings and things. Um, but so this series is really me kind of exploring this time. I only showed it uh, in January of this year because I felt, you know, um, I, I wanted to put it close to the chapter on that life. Uh, one of my students, again, Wen Kai Ji, he gets, he gets two shout outs today. Um, I was talking with him one day and he said, one of my former MFA students, and he was saying, you know, hey, you know, you showed this to all of us, right? And you showed it to your friends. We haven't shown it to the greater world. Maybe that'll help you kind of get past everything, kind of end, you know, that chapter of your life. Um, and they always say for stroke kind of things, you want to try to make it three years. So the three years are this August. So I felt like, okay, this is a good time to try to end that chapter. Um, I take students from Manhattanville on study abroad, the CAM study abroad program. Um, so we've been to Tokyo. We were going to Iceland, and then COVID happened. So now we're going to Iceland in January. Um, and we're going to Barcelona next year, hopefully, as long as everything works out. Um, so for this work, I, I kind of, sorry, the quality is a little bit lower. Um, I noticed that there was this kind of isolation I saw in Tokyo, where there was so many people, but a lot of people were by themselves, right? And they were not necessarily interacting with others. So I, again, like 
on the strategy list I gave you, I'm definitely the rule person, right? So I made a rule for myself where um, I kind of looked out for those people. One individual even, I don't think I included the, the image in this one, but I followed them basically. I woke up early in the morning and I followed them from when I saw them walking past my hotel to their job. And I kind of just walked far away and said, okay, well, what's this guy doing today? What's his life like? What's he, what's he do? Um, so just these solitary figures. This was in an arcade. Margot was at the arcade with us in the middle of the night. And there was just a lot of these kind of solitary figures. And for someone that was just more people than I've ever seen, even as a New Yorker, um, it was interesting to find these quiet moments. Um, I just did a artist residency in New Mexico. Um, and a former MFA student of mine, Nicole Block, and I went and uh, we had a great time. So one thing if, if you know about me is that I love the woods and nature and kind of escaping into the nature. Um, and I'm so a comfortable being, I'm so comfortable being by myself, but being in the desert was so surprising to me. It was a shock. When I got there, it didn't feel, the, I didn't feel the comfort of being alone. I felt this kind of overwhelming like anxiety about it. Maybe because there was no trees, maybe there was just the time in my life, uh, but it was just this, this, this really feeling of comfortableness. So I started trying to document Nicole from really far away. So I had a, I think this was a 300 millimeter lens and I was pretty far away. This was at White Sands National Monument. Um, and I would photograph her as this kind of lone little figure because it was kind of what I felt at nighttime. The second the night set and it was just this empty landscape. Um, how do I switch to the next one? There you go. And so it was just her from as these little tiny little figures far away. This was during a hail storm on the Rio Grande. I don't, was not expecting hail in New Mexico. Um, we actually went so far up once to the national forest up there that there was about like four inches of snow on the ground. Um, so it was definitely an interesting time. Let's see if I have anything else. Those are the pieces I added on here. Um, but I have a website, justinbecabo.com, um, that has more work too. I'll put it in. The, I'll put it in the chat. Nice. Any more questions? Uh, and you can definitely ask this alumni too. Any information about the college and what we're doing in the fab lab or photo or what kind of gear we got or when and where's your next show? Thank you, Cheryl. So right now I ha was supposed to have a show that was going up in March, um, and that got again postponed because of COVID. <laughs> So hopefully, you know, I, I'm a member of Soho Photo Gallery, so I'll have a yearly sh solo show there. Um, so hopefully next year I'll have a show. Right now, I, I'm, you know, again, with COVID, I'm, I'm guessing hopefully the gallery will be open by January. Um, but my plan is to really, I've been experimenting a lot with AI and automation. Um, so with my students, I teach not only photography, um, but also motion graphics, graphic design, those kind of things, um, and computer graphics. And so... A lot of the things we do, like rotoscoping, something where you're taking a video of someone and you make it a um, an animation, right? Um, it used to be this painstaking process would take hours and hours and hours. And now there's AI programs that are kind of experimental. That what you do is you just put in one, you know, one screen capture of your video, hand draw on it, and it will automatically do it for the rest, right? So I got really into this idea of like, well kind of with this conceptual idea too, you know, who's the owner of the art, right? If I create a program that creates a photograph, did I still create a photograph? Am I the artist or is the program the artist? Um, so I'm really interested in that. And I've been exploring a lot with this kind of idea of automation um, and AI, um, especially with the talks of, you know, factories and truck drivers and all these things, the automation is kind of idea of new, how society's changing in that way. I really wanted to explore that. So I've been tinkering around with a lot of kind of experimental programs this summer um, where I ingest a ton of different images. I'll go outside and I'll photograph the ground for like four hours and just images. And all of a sudden I have this 3D model of the ground in that space. What can I do with it, right? What if I change it in some way, right? What, what, I've just been in that experimental stage. Um, is all your photography, uh, photography digital? So most of my photos digital. I do shoot film. I took a 6.9 film camera, which is like a really wide medium shot um, to uh, New Mexico. Um, most of the film I got back, and I've been tooling around some things with the, um, the satellite dishes there and stuff. Um, I still have a lot of film at uh, Color House in the Lower East Side that is, that is sitting there since COVID. Um, 
So one day I'll, I'll, I'll be able to go into the city and get that film. <laughs> um, but traditionally, I, I definitely do a lot more digital. You know, I started at Manhattanville in 2006 uh, when I was a student. And, you know, we had 10 megapixel cameras at that point. I think the 5D Mark I might have been out by then. Um, and so I've definitely kind of been able to have a serviceable digital camera and then build my way up. Um, but when I was at LIU Post, the students were really film obsessed. Um, and our students are definitely too. I think, you know, the film's making this big resurgence, um, especially with uh, our younger new undergraduates. Anything else? I thought you did your MFA. I was planning on doing minor photography as well. I just wanted to know from your experience. Sure, absolutely. So an MFA program is a little bit different than an MA, right? So sometimes people will see, okay, there's an MA program. It's about 30 credits. And it's really, MA is more about, you know, your technical things, right? You're going to take a lot of photo classes and, or classes that are really about the technique. And MFA is a lot more independent, right? So when you go into an MFA program, most of the time you're working in the studio by yourself or with a studio partner and faculty will come occasionally, you know, usually have some advisors that come in and they'll come around every month or two and do a larger critique, right? So it's really about independent work and really giving yourself the time to say, I'm going to dedicate, you know, these years of my life to creating work and really expediting my growth. Um, so don't, I wouldn't go into an MFA expecting, you know, really kind of like a handheld classroom structure thing or this is kind of, back and forth and this is kind of professor is lecturing, student is writing kind of um, environment, it's much more collaborative, right? And the idea is that when you're in an MFA program, you're a professional working artist as, as your professors are, right? So it's really collaborative. I, you know, a lot of my best friends now are my professors during my MFA program um, and I've been in shows with them and I've worked with them and it's really, you know, giving yourself the time, A, when you are an undergrad program, right? You have this kind of tribe right? All of us have been to Manhattanville, and we know that there's this kind of, you know, personality type. We all kind of fit together, right? And when you leave undergrad, you kind of lose that sometimes, right? You still have your friend group, but they might not share some of the same interests, and it's really hard to grow if you don't have someone to bounce ideas off of, right? So being able to say, like, hey, this is my work. What do you think? Get constructive feedback back from it is really important. So an MFA program gives you that kind of tribe. And even if it's only for those two to three years, um, it's really important. You know, I still, every time, you know, for my show in Soho, uh, I printed them all out with Allie Rafrano and made her look at everything, give me feedback. And Allie's definitely like my main <laughs> uh, person I look to for guidance that way with all of my work. Um, and, you know, those are the things you gain in an MFA program. It's people that like lifelong, you're going to be able to, you know, bounce ideas off of and collaborate with and learn from. Um, so I would definitely recommend it. I think it's, it's a, it's a very important idea. Um, I could hint at something. No, I won't hint at something. Yeah, I don't think I should hint at something. But there might be some news related to that. Um, but yeah, so I think in MFA programs, definitely. Oh, thank you, Allie. No problem, Janae. Any other questions? Again, if anyone has any questions about anything, feel free to email me. Um, it's just justin.capalba at Emville. Um, and I'm always around. I've got nowhere to go this summer. <laughs> um, I am a big traveler, and I, I do like doing these study abroad. Um, so that's been the, you know, a little tough having to postpone some of those, but we'll get there. And so soon you'll see, you know, all of uh, our students work up from Iceland and then Barcelona too. Perfect. Oh, thank you, Allie. Anyone else have any other questions? Thank you. No problem, Steffi. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Perfect. So, I don't know, like any Zoom call, I don't know how to end these ever really. So I will maybe point to Michelle, who's used to ending these kind of things. I think with my classes, everyone just eventually kind of just disappears slowly. <laughs> Yeah, um, if there are no more questions, then thank you so much everyone for attending and thank you so much, Justin, for spending your evening with us. I think it was really wonderful. Um, remember everyone to keep your eye on your, alum your email inbox for more alumni events and the recording of Justin's talk will be on the alumni website um, by, by Friday.
So um, if you if you had a friend who missed it, they'll be able to see it. So all right, everyone, um, have a wonderful evening. We'll Perfect. sign off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody.